The growing zeal for providing equal quality care to black and white patients within the same facility arose from a number of different sources, which united to lobby for federal hospital aid, uh, for federal aid to hospital construction. In a 1945 report to the North Carolina Medical Care Commission, this is the, the state health agency, uh, rural sociologist Celse Mayo <coughs> argued, quote, the people of North Carolina are too poor to afford bilateral arrangements in health education, medical care facilities, and in methods of paying for their services. At the same time, the state is too poor not to provide for one complete system of medical care. Two systems, meaning two architecturally separate systems, will mean lower standards and poorer services for both the white and Negro populations, unquote. Mayo's vision of one complete system of medical care built on the Duke Endowment's success during the 1930s in promoting equal quality care for black patients in white-run hospitals. And that's very important. This was all about patients. It was not about integrating the staffs of these hospitals. They were all white. The, what I just showed you at, at Charity, Tulane and LSU were all white medical schools. The entire staff was white. Except, I, I would add, for the nurses, because Earl Long, Huey's brother, uh, said that uh, we could not possibly allow uh, white uh, black patients to be treated by white nurses. Uh, you know, as a, um, so he used that, um, basically sexism, to, uh, and racism, to open charity hospitals to black nurses for the black patients on the boards. Um, during World War II, black and white patients were cared for by integrated staffs in southern military hospitals, including Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and Camp Pendleton, Louisiana. Black activists from every national black organization testified in congressional hearings on federal health legislation, which provided a rare forum to discuss equality during an era when all other civil rights legislation was doomed to failure. Whites responded to blacks' requests for inclusion in public health programs and even began to express pride in living up to the promise of separate and equal. Here at the University of North Carolina, when it drew up plans in 1949 for the teaching hospital for the medical school here, funded by Bill Burton, the administration and board of trustees envisioned from the very first a facility that would be, quote, for white and Negro patients with separate wards, dining facilities, and so forth. This concept has been carried out in all the planning of the hospital. When I first read that, it's like, well, so what? But at the time, they were extremely proud that they were including black and white patients because it was unusual, it was different. It had never been done before. Historians have criticized the New Deal for its exclusion of blacks in U.S. history textbooks to fit this wide gulf between the New Deal and the Civil Rights Movement. Um, the progression from the New Deal to the Civil Rights Movement was much clearer in health than in any other area of public policy. 1938 brought a series of events that would mark the opening of the deluxe Jim Crow era. In healthcare, the 1938 Gaines versus Missouri decision may have been in more influential than Brown in transforming and ultimately ending segregation. The report on the economic conditions of the South and the Gaines versus Missouri decision together signaled the federal government's commitment to both regional and racial equalization. And most white Southerners seemed ready to follow suit. <coughs> so uh, the, if, if you've read um, from Cotton Belt to Sun Belt, uh, which is about the report on the FM conditions of the South and the whole regional economic development of the South by the federal government, um, you know, they said the South's number one economic problem of the nation and, and channeled federal resources into the southern economy. And then the Surgeon General at the time, Thomas Perrin, uh, you know, in parallel said the South is the number one health problem of the nation as well. Um, so the New Deal headed south with programs designed to apply massive federal resources to bring the region's economy into the national mainstream. The South in 1940 contained 62% of African Americans and half of rural Americans whose abysmal health status was starkly portrayed in a flurry of reports and articles that highlighted the nation's worst race of morbidity, mortality, and particularly wartime draft projections. Um, you can see up here that half the uh, draftees in the, from the South were rejected for service during World War II. 
Um, and that figure is 75% uh, of black Southerners and 40-something uh, percent of white Southerners. But anyway, a very high percentage. So in the South, which was very pro-World War II and saw themselves as you know, the, the military um, heroes, this was bad, bad news. And it really got a lot of Southern state governments to start doing health reform. Um, the South became the main target of early federal health policy because the nation's most medically underserved populations were concentrated there. The Lux Jim Crow grew from, uh, sorry, um, grew from a political nexus of national black organizations, white southern politicians and health reformers, and New Deal liberals. Health was a rare area of common ground during a period of extreme racial polarization. Public health was one of the earliest emphases of federal aid to states. I think I went wrong slide. I think you passed that. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, please. This is kind of pretty. Okay, now how do I get it? Just click. Okay, sorry. Yeah, okay, well, there's the. That's fine. Um, the public health service played a major role in all this. Um, health was a major exception to Southern anti federalism. And during the, all the way back to the Southern anti book board campaign in the 1910s, the Rockefeller Foundation partnered with the U.S. Public Health Service to use matching grants to state and local governments to promote expansion of public health services. The Public Health Service was really one of the only federal agency that had any significant presence in the southern states at that point in history. Um, the strategy would be adopted in federal health legislation like Shepherd Towner uh, Maternal and Child Health Act. That's the first real federal uh, health program in 1921. The Social Security Act of 1935, which was extremely important to the South, uh, it had a public health title. Uh, and the Venereal Disease Control Act of 1938. As a result of uh, its efforts in fighting southern diseases of poverty, such as hookworm, pellagra, tularemia, trachoma, tuberculosis, and malaria, the Public Health Service earned the trust of southern blacks as well as white officials and physicians. <coughs> the PHS administered the public health programs funded under the Social Security Act, which provided the first major federal funding for public health services especially maternal and infant care and child health. So as uh, doctor's offices were standing empty and hospitals were having difficulty filling their beds with patients because no one had any money to pay for any of this, um, the public health service was really stepping in and providing a great deal of care, particularly the maternal and the infant <coughs> clinics uh, were very important in, in the South. Um, Across the South, attendance at the public health clinics funded by Social Security was overwhelmingly black. Black mothers and infants also benefited greatly from the emergency maternity and infant care program during World War II that provided hospital deliveries for the wives of U.S. soldiers. The public health service became both the most pro-Southern and the most pro-black federal agency. The PHS was also the first agency to use Negro agents to promote the cause of black health within southern schools and county and state health agencies. The PHS recruited black health professionals to extend public health campaigns to the black population. Uh, they also assumed responsibility in 1930 for National Negro Health Week, which had been founded at Tuskegee in 1915 by uh, Booker T. Washington. So the Negro specialists um, going out into the countryside um, and, and promoting black health and special programs like National Negro Health Week really symbolize the Janus-based nature of Deluxe Jim Crow. They attempted to advocate for blacks and generate support for their problems, but they also promoted the separation of blacks from mainstream programs and institutions. 